Hello everyone and uh, thank you for joining us um, for another webinar in our day of Crest um, intelligence-led penetration uh, testing webinars throughout the day. Um, and this webinar um, is your presenter is Aaron Doby from, and he's from KPMG and he will be talking about Red Team Tales, which I think is a, a, an incredibly um, exciting uh, title here. So I'm really looking forward to uh, this presentation today. So just before I uh, hand over to Aaron, um, I'd just like to go through a few things to the attendees and there will be a chance to, to ask Aaron any questions at the end. Um, if you could type in the question pane. For those of you that have been on before, um, you will know where that question pane is. Um, and for those of you that are new, there is a there's a question pane button, which is in your panel. So if you just click on that, you can type any questions into there and we'll try and get as many asked um, of Aaron at the end of this presentation as we can. So um, thank you all very much for attending and I'm going to pass over to Aaron now. Take care. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Aaron Doby. I'm a pen tester at KPMG. Um, and as Debbie said, I'm going to give you a quick run through of a number of red team techniques that I've had the opportunity to work on over the last six months or so. So most of these kind of techniques that are going to cover address these four problems. Um, we've got five solutions against four issues. Um, they are that blue teams can spot guardrails in macro documents and it kind of ruins the whole adversary simulation um, scenario. They can then kind of take the foot off the throttle a little bit. Um, it kind of ruins the overall experience, et cetera. So looking at how we can address that. Mail filtering's improving and things like newly purchased domains are increasingly getting flagged by default. So looking at some methods of addressing that, being able to still get your mail into inboxes. Uh, looking at mac office macros, how we can make those less suspicious uh, using exploitation of teams, which I know a few people have joined to hear about. And finally, looking at how we can kind of play with IOCs to make it harder to identify other infected hosts once we're inside the network. So the, the solutions we're going to look at are kind of at a high level going to be look, removing the guardrails from our documents, but still having them enforced to, to make sure that we're infecting the correct targets, but also and not kind of accidentally owning another company, um, but kind of moving them away from the endpoint into cloud servers. Um, looking at a couple of non-traditional payload delivery mechanisms, um, trying to use Teams to, to install and execute our second stage, and then kind of looking at this, this IOC piece at the end. So to start, we're going to look at this guardrails piece. So I'd say most people are now using VBA macros for their, their first phase, um, Mac, like malware. So this is uh, Excel, Word, PowerPoint, Access, macros. Um, and to make sure that we're not installing our second stage on a system that isn't owned by the, the target team, uh, generally, red teams will use guardrails. They can take multiple forms and can be of varying levels of complexity. So the first example I've got here is a very simple guardrail. It's essentially just trying to string match the user domain environment variable. And if it doesn't match the expected value, you don't run. If you're kind of a little bit more advanced, maybe you'll use the, the environment variable that you've managed to identify externally, and you'll use that as the key to decrypt your malicious content. So while the second option is good to an extent, it also has the additional benefit of your code won't run on kind of sandbox systems. It has the obvious problem that you have both the key, the encrypted data, and the cipher all within the same document. So it's quite easy to reverse. They just need to kind of you just need the blue team to join the dots to be able to quite trivially reverse that and can typically pull out the domain that you're pulling down the second stage from and any kind of installation steps that you're doing. So to resolve this, I looked into how we can move the, the guardrail to a cloud-based server and kind of complete the processing of the environment variables on there instead. At a high level, the, the macro will send a collection of data that it gathers to 
a web server via post request um, using HTTPS, so it's encrypted, it makes it slightly more difficult to kind of investigate network traffic. Um, and then based on the content of that post request, the web server will either return valid ciphertext or invalid data. So in kind of slightly more detail, the, the macro has a basic stub in it, which will kind of query some environment variables on the host, such as username, host name, uh, domain name, etc., and we'll send that to the server. That will then kind of do some additional processing here to see whether or not the domain name is correct, if the username or host name have been seen before, and ultimately will then that will determine if the the macro is correctly executed when it has this correct ciphered text returned to it, or if it has kind of junk data returned. This kind of has multiple benefits in that it will maintain the execution control provided by a traditional guardrail, so it won't execute on a system that doesn't have the correct uh, domain name, for example, if that's included in your server logic. Um, it removes the inherent red team indicator to, to kind of the blue team that, it, that guardrails traditionally impose on, on standard macro documents because it's just sending data away to the, to the cloud and gets the kind of encrypted data back. You don't necessarily know at that point that it is giving you valid data for one response versus another. Because you have checks for things like hostname and username on the server in that initial request, it kind of enforces a single execution. So users can't execute the payload multiple times, but it also means that you can log failed executions. So if a user is trying to kind of reverse engineer your, your macro and you've seen the, them attempt to do that via that host name before, you can essentially drop all requests from that host name and return the dummy ciphertext. So even if they work out the correct date domain name at a later stage, they still won't be able to get the kind of the actual second stage that they're trying to recover. And then the final benefit with that is because it's sending a lot of data to the server, it removes a lot of the kind of blind hope that's associated with phishing, where you send your email in and you may or may not get any kind of response back um, because it irrelevant of if it successfully is going to fully execute or it's going to partially execute and cancel, it still has to reach out to your server. You get the opportunity for this extra logging step. So you can kind of see a sanitized logging stage on the left. Um, you can see that why a basic logging reason as to why it failed, um, whether or not the payload was returned, things like that, uh, which can give you a bit more insight as to whether or not teams are investigating your payload if you're seeing lots of rapid executions. If the, it could be an automated solution if you're seeing progressively getting closer to executing properly. It may be somebody, an analyst looking at it. And because all of the, the correct ciphertext is held on your server, ultimately you can choose whether or not to continue serving it. You can essentially shut down that server anytime you want to make the macro completely unreversible because the content just is no longer exists in a, in a public form. Ultimately, that kind of you can tie this whole kind of technique together along with variable randomization and a bit of obfuscation, and your macro will look something like this on the right, which becomes much more difficult to kind of reverse purely because you don't have half of the content until execution time, and even then you only get the legitimate content if you have all the correct data. So the next problem that we're going to look at is how we can bypass improving mail filtering. So we've got two techniques to look at for this. The first is going to look at if we could have a user voluntary interact with a USB device. So one of the clients we were working with make use of click share devices, which are essentially a wireless display solution. Um, the, the large dock that you can see connects into the screen. Um, and these kind of USB dongles are, are provided in, in meeting rooms um, and will let you display your, your monitor. When you plug them in, uh, essentially it's, uh, it, it kind of interfaces as both a USB device and, and a, a display device. Um, and on the USB device, it has the drivers as an executable. So when users are 
used to using these devices, if they have issues, commonly the, the default recommendation is just rerun the driver install on, on, on the USB. So I managed to pick one of these up on, on eBay for, for cheap. And the, while we just moved to work from home, it was just a, a small side project. So armed with a, a cheap soldering iron and one of these small USBs, I thought I would crack it open and see what was possible. So fortunately, both the inside of the USB and the click share use a standard USB-A pinout. So it meant that it was fairly trivial to work out what each thing did. Cracking it open, it was basically a, a, a case of splicing the five volt and ground power lines and then uh, breaking the, the, well, moving the data lines from, from the board onto the, the USB. Because I'd spliced the power lines, it meant that all of the lights still triggered on the board. So it kind of appeared to function as normal. But you now had a, a read-write memory rather than the, the read-only memory that was on, on board to start with. So you can see here at the bottom that it, the, it still flashes as normal. Um, but essentially, as a, an attacker, we can write anything we want onto it. And it will appear to work as normal until the user plugs it in. It will flash. It will then not function as a display. The expected user interaction is then to try and rerun the driver install, which, as we discussed earlier, if we can write anything we want, we can replace that executable with, with any kind of malicious binary that we want to get our initial foothold. Um, I should add, if, if it's not apparent, that obviously because we've split the data lines going to the actual device, it will no longer actually function as a, uh, as, as a display device. So if we don't want to send a physical device, we are back to phishing. Um, but what if we could leverage a business logic flaw in a, in a popular platform like Dropbox to bypass even well-tuned well mail filters? We can, if we can get it to set up how, how we kind of would like, essentially we can have a, a platform as a service send the mail for us and we'll rely on their mail reputation to get through the mail kind of filtering. So while having a quick probe around the Dropbox site uh, for something completely different, I realized that when you set up an account, you had the option where you were requested to validate the user email. But if you essentially did forced browsing back to the root website, you were logged in having not validated your email. And that leads to uh, a number of issues. Um, each time I've reported an, a new one that I found, I've checked back and the issue has changed. So I've got some examples for you to consider that may be applicable elsewhere on other, other services um, with a little bit of tweaking and should give you the kind of principle about what, what you should be looking at for this kind of thing. So the initial issue was a combination of uh, lack of input validation and, and forced browsing. So you can see here, um, the mail is sent to the user from dropbox.com and the malicious user and the email address you can see um, are essentially free text fields. Um, because the email address was never required to be validated, you can essentially make it appear as if you sent it from an internal email address. So that's my domain, but it could be your, your client domain and, and a known contact, for example or payroll if you wanted to, if that fit your ruse. So after feeding back to Dropbox, they initially fixed that. And their solution was to remove the email address. Obviously, this still has a reasonable level of flexibility because there's nothing in the email that says that it was not whoever you're, you've used as your, use, your first and last name. Um, so you can see here I use trusted user, but you could obviously use anything you wanted that fit your, your scenario. So pressing forward with that, you can actually set anything you want as your first name and last name. So that could be an email address. That can be, I mean, so here I used an email address as the first name and secure in brackets as the last name. Um, and you can name the document, whatever you'd like. So this is now fixed. Um, the latest update goes to uh, add, requires users to be properly validated and adds at the end of the username, adds the validated email in brackets. 
because you can still enter anything you want as a first name and last name, you can essentially have a first name of a first and last name and a last name of an email address, and you end up with two email addresses showing. Um, but we've had reasonable success still with that technique, even though it has two email addresses showing, as long as you have a half decent ruse to explain why two emails are shown. Um, so I guess this really kind of comes back to the importance of platforms as a service and these kind of large scale providers hardening their systems so that they can't be used for this. Um, and clearly the easiest way to to demonstrate this is to, to kind of find them and inform the vendors because often they're completely unaware of it. So the next problem that we're going to look into is that Office Macros executing applications is inherently suspicious. So to solve this, DLL hijacking comes forward as an as a opportune technique because if you can get your DLL in the correct location and essentially just wait until the application executes, it will handle the execution of the kind of payload itself. So if you can write to the disk, you can basically assume you have execution, but you don't have to use any kind of more suspicious calls within your, your macro or your initial first stage given that's probably most likely to go under the most scrutiny through mail filters and such. So when I was looking at something that I, when Teams was initially pushed to my corporate laptop, I realized it was installing in, in local app data, which is a user editable folder. Um, so I figured it would be worth investigating. Uh, essentially, you could put a DLL with the correct name in, in the folder and it would cause Teams to crash. Uh, but it would fail to execute what was in the macro. Uh, sorry, what was in the DLL. So having managed to kind of determine that teams will attempt to open it and crash given some scenario, given some kind of variables, I kind of went on to investigate it um, and realized that it was looking at the exports versus a known list. And if all of the exports that are expected in the DLL and are, that are used by teams, it will open Ultimately, it will crash if you don't have the actual content in those DLLs. Um, but it it was a fairly simple it's a, it's a fairly simple check they've implemented and is definitely substandard given the all of the DLLs that Teams actually utilizes are all signed by Microsoft, so it would be an easy check to implement. Um, however, they haven't done it. So. You can use the C++ Pragma linker functionality to essentially uh, proxy um, exported DLL functions from another DLL into yours. Um, while to a third party running application or process that tries to use the, the, the function within your DLL, um, it appears as if the function is within your DLL, even though it's actually just redirecting to another location. So you can see at the bottom here, two, two tools. Um, clearly the naming convention on mine isn't quite as well thought out. However, both will essentially allow you to look at the, the ultimate target DLL and create a, a header file that has a full list of all of the functions within it um, using this pragma comment functionality. You can then add that to your DLL and, and when you put it in, in the folder with Teams, Teams will start, it will proxy all of the function calls to the actual DLL and Teams will work as normal. So now I had a DLL that was essentially man in the middling the connection or the, the execution from Teams to the correct location. I could start looking into actually making some use of it. So the process attach case is, uh, triggers basically every time the uh, the DLL is has a function called so is a is a nice regular execution point um, you can see here on the bottom half of this slide that I've got a, an, a number of uh, if functions that will essentially triage if the uh, the, the shell code should be should be run. So you can kind of see here the, the high level steps that the, the DLL will run through. 
at each stage, if it exits out, the the kind of additional on load function will quit, um, but the the kind of forwarding functionality will remain. So uh, ultimately, it won't impact Teams' performance if it's not uh, on on the run through that's going to execute. Um, at high level, essentially, we're checking that we're in the correct area. So if people load it into a sandbox that isn't correctly domain joined and doesn't have the expected um, properties, it will um, essentially quit out without doing anything, just to make it a little bit harder for, for the, the analysts who are trying to look into what, what the payload does. Um, there's a number of other steps that will essentially act as a mutex, so it won't execute too regularly. Uh, during my initial testing, I had a number of times where my laptop became completely unusable. Where I had about 380 Cobalt Strike beacons running simultaneously um, because the number of DLLs that are kind of the functions that are requested are, are often very quick. So uh, you need some kind of uh, limitation on whether or not it will actually execute. Um, because it's a Microsoft signed binary and it's generally seen as non-malicious by all AV vendors, I found that having a having Teams a Teams process loading a function which ultimately injects shellcode back into the Teams EXE uh, running process, um, I didn't actually find any vendors that are currently detecting that. Um, so it's worth considering and is probably a more viable option than injecting into Explorer EXE. Um, so you can also add some additional checks, uh, such as checking the uh, the, the functions that the the process names that are calling the functions um, to make sure that it's not being run by DLL32 and things like that to kind of further throw analysts off the scent. So the final problem that we're going to look at is how do we stop all of our implants being burnt if one laptop or one host gets found and uh, the blue team know it's been compromised so they they set to work extracting IACs. There's a variety of levels of difficulty to acquire IOCs. Um, I guess the chart on the left covers covers most of them. Um, essentially, with this this technique, what we can do is we can remove a large proportion of the trivial to acquire ones, uh, which would be the easiest to search across the network, looking at things like proxy logs um, and and scanning file systems for file hashes, etc. So. Our solution to this was uh, an aggressor script plugin for Cobalt Strike, um, but the, the same process is, is, is applicable to, to basically any means um, as it's, it is more of a functionality of domain fronting than anything else. So I did a short piece of research looking at um, how many domain frontable uh, domains are still accessible on, on Azure. Uh, in, in about two hours, I had 13,000 domain frontable domains. Uh, 56 of these were Microsoft. There were hundreds other of legitimate trusted businesses that you could use, as well as thousands of others of websites that you haven't heard of. Um, but if you're just trying to increase the number of IOCs to the point where you saturate the ability to identify your, your infected hosts, they become viable. So at high level with domain fronting, you, if long as you send traffic to a CDN endpoint, no matter which domain is using it, as long as the host header it within the HTTPS or HTTP request is, is correct to go to your CDN endpoint, it will be routed to the correct location. So essentially, if we have our, our, our malware traffic have the correct host header, but we change the domains that it's going to, that are different CDN endpoints, um, it will route to the correct place. And if we have each different malware implant talking to a different set of public facing domains of that CDN, it becomes much more difficult to track back to the original kind of, the, to be able to track back and identify other hosts that are talking back to the same domains because they're not talking back to the same. So to kind of give a visual representation, this is kind of the typical set up you you might have for example three cdn endpoints or domain fronted domains that all all of like every implant you have will talk to all of those domains the issue that you have is if one laptop's detected and the blue team manages to recover 
either a file hash or the domain names or the IPs, they can iterate across and find the other two hosts here shown on the, on, on the diagram fairly easily by looking at things like proxy logs. So by having a, essentially by, by changing the domains that are exported within or, or injected into your, into your malware where your, your kind of implant is going to talk to, you can drastically increase the, the number of domains that you're using and each, each malware implant can actually talk to separate and non-crossing over sets of domains. So this means that if you have one host detected, they can identify the, the hash, they can identify the IPs, they can identify the domains. And even if they then look across the network for it, it doesn't result in the rest of the implants being caught. So this diagram is a simplification. If you have a pool of 13,000 domains, you could easily be using 10 or 20 domains for each implant. So not only do you have less traffic going to each domain, you'd then have a massive variety. It would kind of make it even harder to find. Um, but I guess the main thing is by not having it overlap of different IOCs between each of your implants themselves, uh, you, can, you can kind of make it much harder to identify other infected hosts. So, the different things that we've covered off are these different five techniques, looking at guardrails, moving them to the cloud, two different methods of delivering our payloads, uh, teams execution, and increasing the number of IOCs that uh, each of our payloads has so that they're harder to cross identify. I will take any questions if you have any questions. Thanks for listening. That's great. Thank you, Aaron. And um, yes, it was a really informative um, presentation. And I want to hand it over to um, the attendees to see uh, what questions um, they have. So we've had one question come in with regards to um, a little bit more elaboration on recon techniques. Can you can you give a bit more on that? Um, I, I can, yes. Um, depending on, if it, I'm not sure if that's relating to a specific, uh, a specific part of the the previous thing or just in general. Um, I guess most recon, it, you're looking at having a, a minimal footprint. So um, things that I found quite useful in the past has been looking using DNS to to find obscure hosts that are, and identify kind of IP ranges, etc. Um, I'm not too sure whether there was a specific aim with that. Um, and we can always ask that person if they, if they could type into the box or if they could just let us know a little bit more if there was a specific that Aaron was speaking about in the presentation that you could you could elaborate yourself on <laughs> just to uh, give Aaron a bit more of a steer. Um, and we've, we've had um, a bit more come in. So they're saying it's more aligned to passive recon um so aaron during your presentation you mentioned that newly um purchased domains are increasingly flagged by uh mail filtering techniques um and do you have any idea how to prevent these kind of filtering techniques when you would uh, like to perform phishing emails for example yep. from yep. these newly purchased yeah so there's there's it's somewhat unavoidable with the the fact that your your domain is going to be publicly identifiable as being recently purchased. So it is always worthwhile having a number of domains on the go that you are making a conscious effort to improve their kind of re reliability or or maybe trusted level. Uh, so that could just be having it purchased and not doing anything for an extended period of time. Um, even just having it for a few weeks seems to be enough to get past that initial, uh, the initial hurdle of, of, of some filters blocking it outright. Um, particularly some of, some of Microsoft products seem to, to have a, a hard limit on a, on a month. Any domains that are less than a month old uh, seem to be blocked almost by default. Um, but doing things like sending legitimate mail from it to, to, to kind of mail that is going via kind of mail filters that are kind of build up a trusted image of the domain um, can help. Um, and obviously having having an actual functional website 
so that you can kind of get your domains listed and things will hopefully build up the profile of your your domains that's great thank you very much and as i say if um aaron has answered your question and you have a bit more to it please feel free to type that into the pane so moving on uh to the next question um with having a single implant reaching out to multiple hosts is that through the CS um, HTTP hosts option or is it done through something different? Um, so I think this is looking at the, the IOCs. So yes, by, by, by specifying kind of, you can specify multiple domains in the, uh, the, the Cobalt Strike panel, um, essentially at a high level, if you, if you keep deleting and recreating the listener with, uh, different domains or, or keep resetting the listener with different domains, you can keep exporting uh, payloads. And even if the payloads you've exported route back via different domains, as long as the C2 profile hasn't changed, the, the team server will still accept uh, the traffic from it. So you can export, you can kind of create your listener, export a pay, your, your shell code or payload or whatever means you're gonna export it, at, then edit the listener again with a new set of domains um, and then re-export it. So we automated that with a, an aggressive script. So you can just hand it a long list of domains and tell it how many domains to use for each set of shell code to pull out. And it will give you a folder full of shell codes, but you can also do it manually if you're doing it on a smaller scale. That's great, thank you. So hopefully that's uh, answered your question. Please let us know if you have any further questions with regards to that. So moving on to uh, the next question, if you're using Cobalt for red team ops, do you find it needs heavily modified to get around AV or is operating in memory still enough evasion? Um, so at network level, uh, you should absolutely be using a, a customized um, C2 profile. Um, and even then, not just a customized one that you've pulled off online, preferably do some research into to what each function does. Um, and Essentially, you want to be looking at whether or not you actually need the functionality. Um, the, the example that jumps to, to my mind is, is whether or not you need staging on, but there's plenty of things that you can turn on and off. Uh, in the most recent blog, you'll have seen that you have an option to, to change the mechanism that's used for key logging. So things like that, by differentiating your, your specific implant, will change its footprint a bit. Um, by default, I would typically export uh, shell code directly from from cobalt strike i wouldn't use any of its inbuilt um inbuilt uh payload exports but that's just a personal preference because then i can tailor the the kind of payload itself to to how i want um build a loader build a more functional application around it so that if it's executed not in exactly how i expect it to it won't actually run the payload um but that seems to be quite reliable in in bypassing most edr products that's great. Thank you very much. And the question before we got a thank you. So you you answered that um, perfectly. So thanks, Aaron. Um, so just if, if we went back to that, that very first question, because the person has kind of elaborated a little bit more on that. So it obviously it started with a bit more elaboration on recon techniques. Um, and then it was um, it's more aligned to um, passive recon. Um, and then um, without raising IOCs, does that help you a little bit more? Yep. So I think I think I think the the question is kind of looking at what what means of gathering information do you have without without raising potentially raising alarm at, at the target. Um, I think the main thing is just utilizing other services in between. So so instead of kind of directly interrogating their their website, maybe use the Wayback Machine and go back to a month before. Um, so you're you're trying to minimise your footprint of directly interacting with with any of the client systems. Obviously, things like LinkedIn are a great source of information, um, and a fantastic way of getting emails for for kind of future phishing campaigns and things. Is just to look back through historical uh, password leaks and, and, and database dumps. There's a trove of of email addresses that have all been legitimately used at some point in the past. Um, there's kind of that gives you lots of options for for gathering more information about your target without necessarily interacting with them directly. Um, things like DNSDB, etc., will also let you gather information from 
kind of data sets that have been pre-gathered, so aren't as a re result of your querying. That's great. Thank you very much. So hopefully that that's answered your uh, question in full. And uh, they've just come back and said, yeah, that was great. That was a, a great explanation. So thanks for that, Aaron. Um, so moving on to the next question. Um, so to avoid breaking windows, um, and hopefully I get these these uh, these right. Do you use um, DLL proxying um, to run the legit um, DLL with your payload dot DLL and what guardrails uh, do you put in to prevent it looping and becoming a and you have to prep, bear with me sorry uh, becoming a denial of service. Okay, so if I jump back through the slides a little bit, um, to so this this kind of flow diagram is essentially the the steps that are put in place when the the DLL executes um, to determine if it should go ahead and uh, kind of trigger the actual uh, shellcode injection functionality. Um, you can see that I've got here the time the, the is the timestamp more than. 450 minutes old so it kind of it stops you being at and potentially triggering multiple times in a short time period um you could obviously go much shorter than that but if you're trying to uh stop yourself uh getting detected you you maybe don't want a payload running all the time as well so having a longer time period can help split that out um but those steps seem quite functional in 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 limiting potentially injecting multiple times resulting in an impact to the the kind of pro the actual product that's great thank you very much um i think we'll have to make this the last question as we're we're coming to the end of the webinar very shortly um but the this question is uh, which is the best cnc you prefer to use so my experience is mostly with with cobalt strike um so i've played around with a couple of others um things like empire um but but i'd say that cobalt strike is the the go-to that, that i've i've used in the past and i i'm quite confident knowing where things are so i think most of it comes down to what you're confident using uh knowing all the functionality that it offers um just by just by practicing with it really that's great. Thank you very much. Um, so we're coming to the end of the, of the webinar. So I'd like to thank Aaron today um, for a great presentation. Um, and uh, thank you to all the attendees um, for coming along today. Um, it is, it's much appreciated. Um, so um, I am sure that if you have any questions, you can always put them to ourselves at marketing at crest-approved.org. Um, we can always pass those through to Aaron if there's anything else that you would like to um, follow up on. Um, and Aaron's got his email address there. So if you would like to contact him directly, then please feel free to do so. Um, so thank you again. And Aaron, I'll just pass back to you to um, say a last couple of words. Um, thank you all for listening. Um, uh, it was a great opportunity to get the chance to talk about this. Uh, if you've got any questions afterwards, please just ping me an email um, and I'll do my best to get you an answer. That's Thanks. great. And thank you for contributing today, Aaron. Um, really great presentation. So thank you, everybody. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. We've still got a few more webinars to come. So please feel free to uh, join in on those. Um, so we look forward to uh, seeing you on those webinars. So take care, everyone. Thank you.